the term cryptocurrency. Uh, and this is applied to Bitcoin because Bitcoin inside of it uses cryptography. Uh, so cryptography is this whole field of study and the most famous algorithm or primitive of, of cryptography is encryption, uh, which I'm sure you, you have some concept of, of what encryption means. You might be surprised to learn that Bitcoin doesn't actually use encryption anywhere. There's no encryption function inside of Bitcoin. Instead, what you can do is you can think of the field of cryptography as being divided into two kinds of sets of primitives. There's a bunch of primitives that provide confidentiality. So that includes encryption. And there's two major flavors of encryption. There's what we call public key encryption and symmetric key encryption. Uh, the other thing that crypto provides is integrity. So if confidentiality is keeping the things that are supposed to be kept secret a secret, uh, the idea of integrity applied to data is it provides some assurance that data hasn't been modified. So to give you one example, let's say Alice is transmitting a, a message to Bob. Uh, Bob receives the message. Bob wants to know that this message is exactly the same as when Alice sent it. Alice's computer didn't change it, or uh, maybe there's uh, it's going across the internet, so there's a bunch of routers or, or different um, middle boxes that, that touch this data. They have the potential to change the data. And so Bob wants to know that this data was unmodified. Uh, in particular, it's not going to prevent the data from being modified, but it, it will, he'll be able to detect it. So when he sees the data and it hasn't been modified, he'll be able to know it. And if it has been modified, he'll be able to detect uh, that it's been modified. So to make all of that work, uh, we have a bunch of integrity primitives. Uh, there's three major ones, and two of them are, are the ones that are used by Bitcoin. So a building block, it's not really an integrity primitive in and of itself. It's more of a building block, uh, but it's called a hash function, uh, which is something that Bitcoin makes extensive use of. Uh, the other is uh, what's called a digital signature. So we're going to talk in detail about what these two primitives are and, and what exactly they're doing for you. Um, and there's also something just for your interest called a Mac. It's kind of like a digital signature where uh, the keys are arranged in a slightly different way. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't use Mac, so we're not, we're not going to talk about those at all. OK, so let's uh, go into the hash function first. So a hash function is an algorithm. It takes one input, a single input. Uh, the input you can think of as data. And what the hash function is doing, this is the way I, I sort of like to think about it in, in the first place, is it's producing an output which you can think of as a kind of fingerprint of the data or a unique identifier for the, the data or a serial number or something like that. Okay, so every piece of data is going to produce a different uh, fingerprint and we're going to have some security properties also on top of the hash function uh, in order to uh, in order to provide certain things that, that we want from the hash function that are going to be useful not just for Bitcoin but hash functions are used all through cryptography so let's uh, switch the notation a bit uh, so it's the exact same thing uh, we'll just switch the notation to a more mathematical form uh, so we can think of y equals h of x uh, so h here is our hash function. x here is our input. y is the output. Now the input, uh, sometimes people use, there's different terminologies. I'll, tr I'll try and just simply call it the input. Uh, sometimes people call it the message because there's often a message that's the type of data that's going in, but it, it can be used for all sorts of things that aren't necessarily messages. And then uh, the, the, other, uh, the other way of describing it that's a lot more formal is to call it a pre-image. Um, and so the output in this, in this case would be called the image. Uh, so this is a sort of basic functional notation. If you have a function, it takes a pre-image and then it spits out uh, an image. Um, the output is sometimes called the hash as well. Uh, so somebody might refer to, you know, the hash of this data is XYZ. Uh, so they'll, they'll use the term hash to refer to the output 
of a hash function. And sometimes they use the term hash to refer to the actual process itself. Uh, and usually it's very clear from the context which, which of the two meanings they mean, and so it's not that confusing. Okay, let's say a, a bit more about this. Now, my goal here is at no point am I gonna show you how a hash function works on the inside. So we're gonna think of it more like a black box. There's this hash function, it's lying on the table. Um, it's good for certain things. Uh, so I really want you to understand what it's good for. Uh, how it actually works inside doesn't really matter. It's not really relevant uh, uh, to this course. And you can take a cryptography course or you know, read the Wikipedia articles on, on different uh, hash functions to, to see how they work on the inside. They aren't magic. There's nothing really special about how they work on the inside. Um, they're also fully specified. Okay, so when I, I know when I first started working on encryption, or I first heard about encryption, I had this sort of assumption that uh, an encryption function was sort of like a secret algorithm. It's a proprietary algorithm, and um, only the people that are sending and receiving the messages know how the function works. Uh, so this is a mental model that some people have of encryption. Um, but it's the case that actually all encryption functions digital signature functions, hash functions, any cryptographic primitive, they're fully specified, they're public. There's nothing secret about the algorithms themselves. Some algorithms might use a secret inside of them. This is called a key. You can think of it as kind of like a password. So when we see digital signatures, we'll see an algorithm that uses a key. A hash function doesn't have a key. There's no secrets that are involved. Um, and that includes the algorithm itself. Okay, so this is a publicly defined algorithm. And there are, uh, there are different hash functions uh, that you might see, um, but there, there's only a handful that you would actually see sort of in practice, okay? So, so you do have to specify which hash function you're using, um, but the list of possible hash functions are, are pretty small. So I'll give you the names of a few hash functions. Um, so there was an early line of hash functions based on MD, uh, so MD4 and MD5. Uh, then there was a series uh, that replaced it called SHA. So SHA1, SHA2, SHA3. And in terms of security, uh, MD4, MD5 are very insecure. Uh, you should not use them. Uh, SHA1 recently, uh, there, I mean, there have been theoretical attacks for a long time, but there's been recently some, some real uh, serious flaws uh, found in SHA-1. Um, in the last couple of years, uh, major, you know, this technology is used in operating systems and browsers and, and all over your computer. And so there's been major efforts to, to remove SHA-1 from ever seeing any sort of use uh, in the real world. Uh, SHA-2 uh, is still secure, as far as we know. And uh, in particular, there's two flavors of SHA-2. Uh, well, there, there's more than two, but there's two common ones. Uh, one's called SHA-256 and one's called SHA-512. And we'll talk about what those mean uh, a little bit later. It doesn't matter right now. But SHA-256 is the one that Bitcoin uses um, everywhere. Uh, there is a weird algorithm that I should add to the list. Uh, it's called RipeMD. And there's different variants of it, but there's... Uh, there's one that's called 160. And Bitcoin also uses this algorithm just once. So there's one specific area where it happens to use this other hash function uh, other than SHA-256. But uh, in general, uh, anytime I talk about Bitcoin's hash function, I mean SHA-256 unless if, if, when I get to this part of the algorithm, I'll specifically uh, mention again that it uses a slightly different algorithm. Uh, SHA-3 is newly standardized. Uh, so it's now available uh, in a lot of software. At the time that Bitcoin was written and it came out, SHA-3 did not exist. Uh, so SHA-3 is newer uh, than Bitcoin itself. So uh, Bitcoin does not use SHA-3, it uses SHA-2, uh, specifically SHA-256. Okay, so that's the algorithm. The other thing I'll note about the algorithm is that it's deterministic. And this is important. First off, what does that mean? What's deterministic? It means very simply, if you give it the same input, you're going to get the same output. So if you give the same input twice, 
once a day, once tomorrow, the output will always be the same. There's no randomness that's involved in this algorithm. Okay, now people use hash functions. There's a sort of direct link to how hash functions are used and randomness itself. And so when we start talking about some of the properties of hash functions, it's easy to get confused to think that a hash function is sort of a random function. You know, you're throwing dice or something like that. Uh, but so I, I want to emphasize that it's it's completely deterministic. So uh, when you come along with the same input, you'll always get the same the same output. The other thing I'll mention about the inputs and the outputs are the sizes of them. So the input of the hash function can be any size. Uh, so typically this is data. So you can think of small pieces of data, like maybe a data record, like a name, credit card number, some small piece of data like that. Uh, you might think of something a bit bigger, like a file that's on your computer. Uh, you might think of a really big piece of data, like an entire database, or maybe the entire contents of your hard drive, or uh, um, your disk partition, all the data that's on that particular partition. You could run that through a hash function and, and get a hash of, of that particular piece of data. So uh, this data can, can really be any size. Uh, so we don't see this a lot in encryption functions. A lot of encryption functions have limits on the sizes of things, but the hash function is designed to, to uh, produce hashes of any size. And the reason you use a hash function is uh, this idea of fingerprinting data is in particular, you want to use it when you have really big data and you want to create a, a small fingerprint for this data. You want a smaller representation of, of what this data is. Uh, so if I want to take the hash of my entire hard drive, what I want is some small like sort of fingerprint or digest uh, that represents that large piece of data. And it's a lot easier to pass around these, these references or these, these digests or these fingerprints than it is to pass around the original data. Um, so what we want from the output is we want it to be small. Okay, small and in particular, it will always be fixed size. And the exact output size um, is, a, it's a matter of, of both convention uh, and it's also a matter of security. There is some security properties that are tied to, to how big these things are. Um, I, because this isn't a crypto course, I won't go through the, the nitty gritty details. I'll just tell you that uh, for SHA-256, the 256 in the name SHA-256 is actually a reference to the output size. Uh, so the output is 256 bits. Okay, and then similarly for RIPEMD-160, as the name implies, um, we have a 160-bit output. Okay, so what does this actually look like in practice? Um, so every computer comes with standard algorithms like SHA-256. Uh, so for example, if you're on a Unix machine or Linux or uh, Mac OS, uh, you can use a terminal. There'll be a, an equivalent way of doing it on Windows. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but uh, let's say we want to create a little file. Um, And then let's say we want to write something into the file. We'll write the word hello. Uh, so what we can do is we have this file. It's called test.txt. It's just sitting on our desktop. And let's say that we want to uh, figure out what the hash is. So this can be the input uh, to our hash function. Um, so if you want to do uh, a SHA family hash, the, the command is SHA sum. And then if you want SHA256, you have to give an extra uh, parameter. Uh, then we can um, compute what it looks like. So you see that number 5891B5B, blah, 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 blah. That's 256 bits. It's represented in hex. Uh, so hex is your numbers from 0 to 9 plus A, B, C, D, E, F. Uh, so 16 uh, possible characters. Uh, but anyways, in, in hexadecimal, that's what a 256-bit number looks like. Okay, So 256 bits, you can think of it as too long to memorize, okay, this is something you write down, but it's very easy to write that number down. Like you could fit it on a piece of paper in a QR code. Uh, you could put that number, you know, you could write lots of them to a file and, and it wouldn't take any space at all, okay? So this is a very compact, succinct uh, hash of, of, of this data. Now, if, if you follow the exact same te test that I did and you write the word hello into a text file and you take the 
uh, SHA-256 hash of it, you should see the exact same response. Okay, so all of our computers, they all implement the exact same algorithm exactly the same way. Uh, we can add, say, the, the, uh, another word to it. So we'll have hello world now. Um, so this is our, our file. Uh, then we can take the hash once again. So this is a different file. It has different contents. And what you'll see is that we'll get a different fingerprint uh, for the file. Okay, so every input will produce a slightly different output. And there's going to be, we're going to spend a little bit more time than, than just that on that exact property because there's some security properties that are tied to that. So we'll be more rigorous. But, but for now, you can think of every input as, as producing a different output. Uh, the other thing I'll note is if you're doing it at home or whatever, uh, it doesn't really matter. Like the, f it, it's only hashing the contents of the file, not the file itself. Uh, so, for example, if we um, rename the file uh, to something else, and then let's say we uh, take the hash of this new file, uh, you'll see that the number comes out exactly the same. The output is the same. So it's just the contents of the file, not the the, the wrapper for the file itself. Okay, so that's that's what the output of a hash function looks like. So let's try and write down, um, just so, so they're in the notes, uh, we'll, we'll write down some of the things that we said in English, and then I'll go through the actual security properties. So we can use it to kind of fingerprint data. And if you hash the same data twice, with the same hash function, so with, say, SHA-256, you get the same fingerprint. Even if these, this is being done on two different computers. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use this to sort of pass fingerprints of data around as opposed to passing the data around itself. Uh, and this, this is going to be useful for, for a number of examples. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go through the properties uh, that we want from a hash function. And this will get slightly formal, uh, but I'll, I'll try and give you the intuition as well uh, to what these properties are. So there's three properties that are kind of the textbook properties that you want from a hash function. They have very formal, kind of scary sounding names, but they're, they're pretty simple concepts. Um, and then there's a couple other properties that people assume that hash functions have, even though technically they might not, uh, but all instances of hash functions that we know about do have these properties. So uh, we'll mention those as well. Okay, so the first property we have is, uh, it's called pre-image resistant. Okay, and so pre-image, remember, is the formal term for the input. So you can think of this as input resistance. And what it means in, in sort of English is informally, it means if you see the output of a hash function, so you see why the hash of data, the output, the image, you can't figure out what the input was that produced that output. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to still be very very informal but I'll, I'll add just a little formality to it. So uh, we'll consider the output of the hash function to be uh, we'll call it d the length of the output. So 256 bits essentially. Okay, so given a d-bit uh, output, uh, we'll say y value, uh, if it's pre-image, if it meets this definition, then it's infeasible 
to find a input value uh, such that the hash of this input value actually turns out to be y. So this is just short for such that. And um, let me highlight two things in this definition. OK, so you're given an output. You're not going to be able to find an input uh, that, that produces that output. OK, that's what this has. Or the way you can think of it is the hash function hides the input. Right? So you can pass around these outputs, and no one can figure out what the inputs are. OK, now there's some caveats uh, to this. So there's three. There's one, there's two that are buried in this definition, and then there's a third that you might not think about uh, until you start thinking a little more deeply about what exactly this definition is saying. So I'll, I'll give you the three caveats. So the two that are buried in the definition are uh, this word infeasible and also this word any. Uh, so these are, are very specifically chosen words that, that um, it's important not to just sort of gloss them over. Um, so first off, let's start with infeasibility. So I'll just put this as notes. OK, so the first thing I'll note about infeasible is it's not the same as impossible. OK, so what we're saying when we say something's infeasible, we actually have a very specific definition of what we mean. What we mean is it's, it's too hard for, for a modern computer to do. OK, and so for a hash function, for example, let's think about what this means. It says, OK, you can't find the input to a given output. Well, if you can try every single input, eventually you're going to find the right one. OK, and when you find the right one, it's going to match the output. And so what we're really saying is uh, you can think of it as there's too many inputs. The input space is too big that you can't try them all. Even if you have a really fast computer, um, you're not going to be able to try every input. OK, um, so. That, that attack, that basic attack of trying every input, uh, that's an important concept in cryptography. It's, we call it an exhaustive search attack. Um, so the way we'll describe it is, uh, the, I'll put it as the best way. To find uh, x an in input given an output, x given y, uh, is to try every value. And this is called exhaustive search. OK, so this is caveat two, or the, the thing that I mentioned that was sort of, you don't see it from the definition itself. But if the number of things that you're hashing is limited, if you have a small number of things that you're hashing, then pre-image resistance is not going to hold. So let me, let me give you an example. Let's say we have like an election and people are voting yes or they're voting no. And instead of saying I vote yes or I vote no, they're saying I vote for the hash of yes or the hash of no. OK, now you're going to have a problem counting up these ballots because as this property implies, no one can reverse what the votes are. But let's leave that aside for a second. Um, note that if I see the hash of your vote, uh, it's true. I don't, I don't know if you voted yes or no. But what I can do is I can take the word yes, I can hash it. I can take the word no, I can hash it. And one of the two is going to match the value that, that you produced. OK, so the only way that you get pre-image resistance is if the number of possible things that you could have hashed uh, is big enough as well. OK, so that's another important property. So if you have a small number of possible messages, 
And small doesn't mean, well, well, actually, I'll give you some numbers for what small means. But if you have small number of possible messages, uh, you can try them all. OK, so what's this pre-image resistant property really saying? What it's saying is that uh, the best attack you can do is exhaustive search. So the hash function itself isn't going to give you any, there's no trick there. There's no way of, if the algorithm is secure, there's no way of shortcoming the fact that you have to do an exhaustive search. Okay, so the hash function is not going to help you, uh, but you can still always do an exhaustive search. So exhaustive search is your, your best attack. Okay. Now, the other thing I'll note, um, actually, let, let me give you some examples of numbers. Uh, so this is what infeasible actually means. Okay, so infeasible means there's a big number of possibilities to search. How big are these numbers? So usually when we think of cryptography, we think of numbers in terms of um, how long they are. Okay, um, so we'll start with, um, let's say that the, the number of uh, possibilities is a number that you can write in 30 bits. Okay, and in, in particular, if, if you're paying closer attention, this has to be a message that's chosen uniformly random from, from all the 30-bit messages, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that aside. Okay, so we have a message that's 30 bits long. How many possible messages are there that are 30 bits long? So if you're, having, if you're struggling with this, think in terms, it's maybe the bits that are throwing you off. So think in terms of decimals, right? If I tell you you have uh, a three decimal number, right? Uh, how many actual numbers are there? Well, there's a thousand, right? There's zero, zero, zero up to nine, 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 which is a thousand different numbers. Okay, so the number of digits, the more digits you have, uh, the more digits that you add, the number of numbers that you can express with that number of digits grows exponentially. So with a 30-bit message, uh, you're going to have two to the 30 possible messages. And let's say that's the space that you're going to, um, it's like a password, it's 30 bits long, it's a random password, and you're going to try all two to the 30 uh, possible messages. Um, that's a pretty big number. Uh, could you do that on a computer? It turns out that you can. Uh, so on a computer, it might take one second. Now let's make this number a little bit bigger. So let's, let's go to like say 60 bits, so we'll double it. Now we have two to the 60 possible messages. And one thing I want to note uh, is we doubled, the number that we doubled is the exponent. Uh, so we went from two to the 30 to two to the 60. That's not the same as doubling this actual number. So for example, if we have a number that's two to the 30 and we double it, that number is going to be two to the 31. Right. In other words, two to the thirty times two, right? So if we double two to the thirty, what we're going to do is we're going to go two times two to the thirty, uh, which is the same as two to the one times two to the thirty, which is the same as two to the one plus thirty, uh, which is the same as two to the thirty-one. Okay, so. If this number goes up by one, we've doubled it. If it goes up one again, we've doubled it again. So to go all the way up to 60, what we've done is we've doubled, 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 doubled 30 times. Okay, so this number is way bigger than two to the 30. Okay, it's not like just twice as big or something like that. Or the number of numbers that you can, so the, sorry, the, the message itself is twice as big, uh, but the number of possible messages uh, has grown what we say exponentially. Okay, it's double, 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 doubled. Okay. Um, so this is big, okay? So if this is taking one second, if we double it and we go to two to the 31, it should take two seconds. If we go to two to the 32, it'll take four seconds, et cetera. Uh, so this is going to, 
uh, it's going to take a long time. Okay. Now it turns out that 2 to the 60 is in the reach of computation. Uh, you're probably not going to do it on a single computer. Um, but for example, you will see that in Bitcoin there's this uh, network of computers that are really, really fast at doing these exhaustive search problems. And uh, if we took that entire network of computers and put them all together, then they could maybe do 2 to the 60. In fact, they can do 2 to the 60. It would take them about 10 minutes. Okay, but this this is is really really large. We think it's it, you know it's a larger cluster of computers than uh, any other cluster of computers that we we know about that are, are working on uh, any particular problem in a coordinated manner. Uh, we don't know, for example, what a, a security agency might have uh, in terms of computational ability, but it's it's probably speculated to to not be in excess of, of a number sort of like this, two to the sixty. Okay. Uh, then what we can do is we can double, 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 double again, uh, and we can go up to, say, 112 bits. So this will be two to the 112 possible messages. And this is thought uh, to be basically impossible. So even if you have all the net, all the computers on Earth and you network them all together, and let's say you run them a really long time, like the lifetime of the universe, you're not going to be able to exhaustively search a space that's 2 to the 112. Okay? Uh, and you know, different governments have, have sat down to try and think about how big does this number have to be uh, for us to know that no computer can do it. And of course, there's a big safety margin that's built into that number. Uh, but this number comes from NIST. Uh, so NIST is a uh, United States-based uh, standards uh, committee. Um, so a lot of cryptography, uh, sort of modern cryptography came out of the United States. So it came out of industry uh, that was based in the United States, like IBM. And the early researchers uh, in cryptography, the academic researchers were uh, largely based at US-based institutions. Uh, so modern cryptography, you can think of as kind of born in the United States. And so the United States were, were the first to start standardizing these types of things. Uh, and as a result, a lot of countries around the world look to the United States standards. It's not to say that other countries don't have their own standards. Some of them do. I'm in Canada, so we use NIST standards uh, in Canada. Um, so NIST is a standards body. And standards bodies will standardize all sorts of things. Like, how do you know an inch is an inch? Well, they'll have like a piece of metal that at a certain temperature is exactly an inch or something like that. Um, so they, they standard all sorts of things, including cryptographies. Uh, and so their current standard or they currently define infeasibility to be uh, Two to the one twelve or greater. So that will be our sort of measuring stick uh, when we see, uh, when we look at hash functions, when we look at digital signatures. We're going to want to see uh, that that the exhaustive search attacks uh, require at least this much work. Uh, so I'll just note that this is infeasible for. all computers for millions of years, for example. Uh, another thing that gets thrown around, and we'll, we'll circle back to this a little later, what about quantum computing? Um, so for exhaustive search, uh, quantum computing doesn't offer much of a speed up. There is, there is one algorithm that, that offers a marginal speed up. Um, but quantum computing will break other aspects. So what we said for a hash function is that if the hash function is secure, exhaustive search is still your best attack. And when you have a quantum computer, that's true. An exhaustive search is still your best attack. And 
Uh, the exhaustive search itself you could do with a quantum computer slightly faster than you could do it with a classical computer, but there's, there's not a big uh, problem for quantum computers applied to hash functions. When we talk about digital signatures, um, the way it's set up now is uh, the fastest attack is a kind of exhaustive search, but the signature algorithm's helping you. So instead of having to exhaustively search um, a really big space, you can make that space a lot smaller by, by applying some math. And with a quantum computer, you'll be able to apply math in a more efficient manner, and you'll be able to radically reduce that space. Uh, so the space that you'll have to search is, is, is really smaller. You can think of it slightly differently as, as you'll be able to search that space faster. Um, but it's the mathematical nature of the signature that's, that's giving the speed up. It's not that the raw ability to exhaustively search a space is, is becoming faster. So anyway, that, that's a lot of sort of nuance that, that you don't have to care about. I'm not going to test you on, on that, but um, that's just for your own interest uh, if you've talked about, if you've heard about quantum computing. Uh, I'll try and circle back to the question of quantum computing once you've seen how Bitcoin actually works uh, in terms of how it's using this cryptography.